Sharice, did you miss me? I miss you. It's been, I miss it's you, been Jay. what? It's been how many weeks? Two, Two weeks. weeks. Two weeks. Holidays, and then you were traveling. Where are you right now? I'm in Kyoto right now. I was in Tokyo for the last eight days or so, and I just got into Kyoto last night. And it is really to- cold. It is one mm-hmm. degree Celsius here right now. Have you been to Kyoto before? I have been before. Okay, so you kind of know what to expect. Yes, I kind of know what to expect. Yeah. And I am back to work. Yes, yeah, after your 10-day holiday. Must be nice. <laughs> I say that with not a lot of enthusiasm. I'm I trying know. to hold it down. I know. Um, I, do you want to talk about the briefing escapades mm. that you got up to? The briefing yeah, it was just fiasco? a lot. It was just a lot to do. Uh, Honestly, it's not not really any excuses, but just like missed some details, missed like some fine. stuff. But um, yeah, hope uh, hope no one took too much offense to a I, half I don't, half I don't, put together newsletter. I don't think they get offended, so to speak. Disappointed. Di- okay, yeah. You're, disappointed. People aren't angry; they're disappointed. Disappointed just, is more accurate. Yeah, I honestly missed the uh, the routine. I was just looking forward to it every single week to record, you know, making it up. Yeah, I kind of missed it too. I did kind of miss it. I have like yeah. things to talk about and, you know, miss the yeah. challenging questions. Yeah, it's been super busy over here and it's been kind of cold in Hong Kong. But um, other than that, I think everything is going good. I'm kind of happy to be back into the grind of things after New Year's and whatnot. Yeah, back to work for everyone. Until we go yeah. on Lunar New Year holiday in a month. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> weird how there's so many big holidays that are sort of lumped together at the end of the year and slash start of the year. Yeah. It, it really means nobody gets a lot of work done for six weeks. Yeah, it's kind of like you spend a, a week kind of right after New Year's and then you got you have three weeks to kind of spin things up and then all of a sudden you're on Chinese New Year, so. Oh, yo, actually, you know what's cool is I did those two stories in Tokyo, which... Oh, yeah, maybe you can give people a little bit of a heads up or a teaser. Yeah, I mean, it was just fun because it was getting to meet some creative people in Tokyo and have, I think, I think it's like the ultimate travel experience is trying to get an insider look into a city which is why it's so good if you can like meet up with a local or if you can get like a local's recommendations, but being able to really fortunately get to sit down and talk to two different people on two different days for like an hour gives you a perspective you really could not get otherwise. Oh, nice. Yeah. And and also I think it's just good to be able to explore stories of different categories, kind of meeting with people that don't necessarily fall within one particular silo. Yeah. I think you, like, who are the two people you ended up meeting with? Okay, so the first person, his name is Christopher Hansi, and he's a Australian fashion designer who wound up moving to Tokyo and has been working on a fashion brand called Bogan. He uses this 13th century, like, very old dyeing technique that um, dyes textiles in mud. And it's interesting because the second person I met, she's a native Tokyo woman, but she studied abroad in Australia so I actually wound up speaking to two people with Australian accents. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was funny also the commonalities because they both really talked about fighting against quickness, like fighting against how um, commercial industries kind of s- try to speed things up, try to determine a pace that's not natural. Yeah. Um, so I saw that as a common theme. Oh, that's interesting. Do you think that there's something to be said that both of your subjects had some sort of Western background or influence? Well, I mean, it's partially like, because I had to find English speakers because I don't speak Japanese. So that was part got of it. That was part of the requirement for me. Um, yeah. But I do think it becomes interesting in a sense because they are, they they definitely have perspective into Tokyo while also being a little bit of an outsider in a way. Got it. Which is kind of like what we are in Hong Kong. Yeah. No, yeah. Well, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to call us outsiders, but just we generally have like a sort of different placement within it all. It's kind of like you're neither here or there. Yeah. I mean, that's very well documented. Yeah. In terms yeah. of people that have this kind of duality in culture, it's like you, you're never fully embraced by either side, and you just need to kind of live with it. 
Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and yeah. both of them, they, they're not like bitter about it. It's just like the reality of their identity. You're currently sitting where in a cafe? Oh, yeah, I should explain. Um, no, so I'm staying at this hostel called Peace Hostel Sanjo. And actually, this space is really nice. I'll send you a photo later. That they've got this really big working space, which is part of the reason I picked this hostel. The mm-hmm. only downside is that they somehow feel the need to pipe in background music even though it's clearly like meant to be a working space cool well let's let's kick things off you want to start start us off for the day you know i don't even know what your topic is so i guess i have to do you even have a topic i do have a topic there was so much hesitation there that i have like doubts about whether whether i i kind of feel like in the last five seconds you picked your topic in your head no no No? maybe Anyways. All right, whatever. I can't prove it. I can't prove it. No, I'm fine with starting. I just wanted to just wanted to mention the fact that we're going into your section blind from my end. I think you'll be well well equipped for it though. Okay, here we go. So, oh wait, wait. Before I go any further, I have to ask, can I say his name? Uh What do you mean? Cuz it's do you count it as a profanity? Oh. I mean, Mm, yeah, no, it's fine. You can say it. Okay. Yeah, no, you can say it, yeah. Just wanted to be extra careful. All right. Well, so, yeah. the rapper formerly known as Rich Chiga changed his name to Rich Brian. His birth name is Brian. Wait, is it, is it Rich Brian or Brian? Rich Brian. Are you sure? That's what it's being used as. Like oh, on. I I... That's what I see on YouTube and articles now. Anyways, weird because I thought it was just Brian. I'm pretty sure it's Rich Brian, but, but, his, anyways, but even no, but, his Twitter handle, he's still putting it as Rich no, Brian. No, you know what? Honestly, it was Brian, and now I think it's Rich Brian. I honestly think it was like a, a version 2 switch and then a 2.1 switch. Okay, well, wait, let me continue. So if anyone is not familiar, this person, formerly known as Rich Chica, is Brian Emanuel. He is 18 years old. He's from Jakarta, Indonesia. In the last year, he has collaborated with 21 Savage. He came out with this like parody rap video called That Stick that became really crazy popular beyond what his imagination of it was. And there has been a lot of debate over his name. There have been articles published about whether it's okay. He has said even as early as nine months ago, actually April 13, 2016, that would be that would be over a year ago. As he said in the past, like, oh, there's so many profanities. Okay, Rich Chica is an effing corny F name. Why did I think it was okay? Why did I let this happen? So he's even spoken before in interviews and on Twitter, like, hey, actually, I don't think my name's so great. But for whatever reason, he stuck with it. And he's even yeah. said, like, I feel like I am stuck with this name. Uh, I okay. think that honestly... It's easy for him to come and look retrospectively and feel bad, like look back and feel embarrassed. But dude, it's, it's something that happened in your teenage years. I, I personally don't hold it against him. Yeah, I don't, I don't either. I, I maybe also the word itself doesn't impact me the same way. So like I'm also very careful to like to, to sort of be respectful of that element. But it's some dumb shit that like a teenager did. I don't think he needs to feel as bad about it as he does. I actually am more interested in the implications and what sort of pushed him to actually go and change it or you know was it the internet i'm sure it's a combination of things to be honest i'm sure it's yeah. the internet yeah i'm sure it may be pressure from record labels to potentially put him in a more mainstream light yeah there's probably all these confounding factors what i do feel interesting and it, you know it's it's interesting you brought this up because I, i've always i've i've found this this whole topic very fascinating and i actually wasn't deliberately going to pick it because i wanted to see if we could maybe bring in some other people with other POVs within hip hop in Asia slash China and just like how they feel about appropriation. But I think this is a good sort of jumpstart into the topic. Right. Yeah. But, but for someone that's never seen like um, a Brian slash rich Brian video, even the first one, how would you sort of position it? And do you feel like the name itself actually worked more so with, well, not Mm. that it doesn't work now, but I kind of feel there was some sort of consistency be, between okay. it all. Well, I actually think the whole, I think the reasoning behind changing his name to Brian makes sense as a larger, larger identity related change. Because I think his his first song, he's come out and said he made that that stick 
as a kind of joke, as a parody, right? At the time, I think he was 15 or just very young, right? And so what it is, it's definitely a kind of acting black, like a lot of tropes from hip hop videos, you know, cars and money and girls and that kind of thing. Yeah, and, totally. and, and it's, it's very, it's, it's funny because I don't think he even expected people to, or I mean, I, I'm not saying he's naive, but I think he was surprised that people were like, oh, you've got talent, you've got flow, like you're, you know, you've got Yeah, rhymes. like you're a legitimate act, yeah. basically. I think that also probably kept him sort of off balance maybe is the word because mm-hmm. I don't think anyone expected him to blow up the way he did. No, I don't think so. So it's kind of himself. like, yeah, which I think is totally realistic. Like I think he should just almost, I mean this, I, I can't speak for the, for, for Brian, but I'm just feel, I just feel like there has to be like a level of confidence and like understanding just how difficult it was for someone to be in Indonesia to actually become like a globally, known in a in a certain degree a globally known like he's been on the same tv show as or the same radio show as pharrell for example so he's in front of like people that are in this industry yeah so like i think that honestly there has to be some sort of understanding of where you came from yeah not to feel as though hey you know what like i made a mistake like dude it's not easy for you not to come out of a place like that and actually earn some sort of global respect yeah and i think it's anyway to get on about the entire identity change is that he also dropped a new song called See Me. And if you read the lyrics of it, it's really about... And it's interesting because he is like middle-class Asian, right? And he's come out and he said, you know, I don't want to write songs that are about murdering people or, you know, experiences that I don't have that are like rap tropes. Like, I want to rap about my experience. So it's interesting to think, like, what does rap sound like when it's about a middle-class Asian life? Like, I, I'm... I'm sure that he will find interesting subjects to talk about, but I'm sh- I think there are people yeah. out there who I, yeah. see it as like, oh, is it really rap? Like, is it really hip hop? Yeah, yeah, totally. I th- I think that in many ways, I'm not necessarily condoning the original name so much as like letting him sort of live a little and yeah. being naive and having this sense of like um, maybe a lack of context through a lack of experience, yeah. right? Like, I think that's the most interesting thing. Like, to know that where you've come and where you want to go is I think one of the most important things when you're, you know, a teenager trying to figure shit out. So for me, I think it signals a lot of things. I think this, this is a good move for, I guess, hip hop in general. And this could open up a massive can of worms in the sense that the reason why I wanted to introduce a few different points of view was that as it pertains to sort of appropriation, cultural appropriation, what is sort of the, the general positioning and understanding of hip hop now, mm-hmm. meaning has it graduated into a global phenomenon or is it still something tightly guarded within, you know, a certain s- culture within, within America, which I think everyone would sort of argue it's mainstream now. So it kind of yeah. affects everybody. Yeah. yeah. I think what I've seen other people comment on that I agree with is that when people who are not part of that tightly guarded circle, right? Like who don't look like they belong to that core, try to get into hip hop. Something really important is that they have to be honest about where they came from, like acknowledging the history, acknowledging the people that came before them. Right. Authenticity and just like awareness, like being very self-aware. See, I don't know. That's the thing that I think some people push back on and, and, Ignorance, if it's ignorance, if it's not necessarily positioned in a way that's sort of demeaning or disrespectful, it's a very fine line because when that happens, it's like ignorance. Like let's let's use the context of like China, right? And I think this is something that kind of has been at the forefront of my thought process too, is that all these acts that are emerging that don't have necessarily free access to all the different resources and information that surround the history of hip hop, which I would say is generally decently documented, yeah. right? Like yeah, yeah, they don't I have would. access to that. So like the way that they've applied themselves within that space, if anything, just doing it and not really giving a shit about institutions and what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do, I think in many ways could be considered at the very core, a sort of hip hop mentality. 
So I think that's the, the interesting thing is like hip hop craves authenticity. But if ignorance is your authenticity, what does that mean? Oh, I don't think that I don't I don't give it a pass. I mean, yes, like especially in China vs. Indonesia or China with a firewall, right? Meaning that they have even more limited knowledge. But there have to be things that that you're doing that you if you're common sense, right? Like you just think like I don't know. Common sense is not always that common, which is why I I, I personally feel as though it's such a, a very messy and difficult topic that it's so culturally dependent on what's happening on the ground. Well, something I, something else that I would just like hope for for like Asian hip hop is that they find a way to be truly Asian without being like an imitation, without trying to be like a derivative of American yeah. hip hop. And I think in in trying, if if these artists seek to be authentically Asian hip hop artists, then they wouldn't they would just naturally not step over inappropriate lines. It, it will need some sort of generational sort of establishment for that to happen. Because when you don't even have a foundation and there's no sort of history to fall back on, it's difficult for you to like, you know, hone in on something or lock in on any sort of particular concept. So you kind of go where it already exists and then you apply it in your own sort of context and, I think that this is the one thing that people need to understand. I think about a, a culture like China, and I'm just as bad for it. Is like you kind of you sometimes look at things that happen in China and you are quick to dismiss, like, oh, that's that lacks taste or class. But I mean, they don't they don't really know where to start, but they're starting. So I think that it's it's going to be interesting, you know, in five, ten, twenty years, like how they've taken it and run with it versus what it is now. Yeah, I think I, I accept that. I think there is like an expiry period on doing things out of ignorance or doing things without seeking within your ability to know more and change, which is the same way I feel about Brian is that I think there is a period of time where it's not going to be okay anymore for him to be like appropriating black hip hop culture be because he's signed with 88 Rising. Like he has more experiences in the States now. Like these things... They, they have to change what he knows and what he's willing to learn about. Yeah, totally. I 100% agree. It's we're, we'll, we're just going to need to see what are the different sort of paths that exist. And they're not all linear. It's not like you're just going to cookie cutter, copy and paste how hip hop played out in the United States. Like there's a lot of different socioeconomic factors at play that may not replicate themselves necessarily in the context of China or Indonesia or South Africa, you know? So I think that's the most interesting thing is, but I also, I'm not sure how people who are deep within a culture necessarily see how outside people are applying themselves based on the framework they've created. And are, is there expectation, whether it's right or not, is there expectation for you to take what has been established and just build on that? Or is it to kind of give you sort of the underlying mentality of, hey, you know what? Hip hop is honestly about doing your own thing. And then any which way you want to apply that, that's up to you. You know, one is a more philosophical sort of guiding approach. The other one is more like gate, more of a gatekeeper approach. I don't think I've, in, in researching the subject and reading some people's perspectives, I haven't read that much about, like I haven't seen a lot of that gatekeeping mentality. I think it's just that what they want to see is authenticity. Like I already said, is that yes, there we can make some love, some period of excuse for ignorance and learning. But after that, I think when you, not necessarily in your lyrics, but when you talk about your music, there should be recognition of what you're building on top of. Like I would never hope to hear some, like Brian say that I'm the first right like because that's just not the case actually one thing I wanted to talk about as well why I one of the reasons why I picked this topic is because uh two nights ago um we had the opportunity to see a DJ set in Tokyo uh and we went to this local cafe called Fab Cafe uh it's kind of on the outskirts of Shibuya and it's because we wanted to see Yuki Beb I don't know if you know of her, but she's a DJ with Selection who's based in Tokyo. And it was just something Stanley um, remarked on was that it was really cool to see them be able to mix 
Japanese and Western culture in a way that we don't see here at see in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Like we don't see this fusion of, you know, speaking Cantonese and Chinese and Westerners mixed in that way, in a, in a way where both parties are like comfortable and sharing a space and sharing music. And they they were able to do it in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Obviously like there are a lot of factors that are different between those two cultures, but I just felt like, they have something that we don't. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, it's interesting because I don't know what it was like, you know, let's say 20 years ago and how Japanese hip hop was perceived within sort of the global, well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's still the American market. But I think if you look at Japanese hip hop, they've paid enough attention and respect to the, to the sort of forefathers to actually garner respect. And I think it's kind of like, will China, will Korea follow suit and not necessarily do the exact same thing, but will they have some sort of that that foundation there? Mm -hmm. Which I think they will. It's just a matter of like establishing something so it has enough time to germinate and grow. You can't just expect, you know, every single person that's interested in this culture to become experts over the course of two years. Yeah, That's just not real. Oh, I had one more question for you, actually. Yeah. Have you read about or talked about the idea of Asians as the model minority? I mean, we kind of talk about it. It's kind of like... Like the two I, of us talked about it? No, we haven't talked about it on... I think in general, I, I just... I've brought this up in some sort of passing way. Not, But I I don't know. I think the model minority thing is very valid. Yeah. But I, I honestly am not even sure if it's interesting because I, I think it's like... How do I put it? I mean, I don't even know where, what, what slant you're taking with this, but like for me personally, I think about it like I'm not for a second going to bitch about being a model minority because it's already so much better than, you know, the positioning of, of other minorities. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Well, the, okay, what, what I wanted to get onto, sorry, I did. I just sort of sprung it on you, open-minded, is that open-handed, um, is that thinking about something I've been thinking about is myself, right, as a model minority, as a minority as a minority that gets passes in ways that other minorities don't like we get, we get more of that kind of white privilege, right. Despite being a minority. Um, and something that I think is important that I've been thinking about is being aware of that and helping other minorities who are less fortunate, like who, yeah, who, who don't get the privileges that we do. And so for Brian, like I think about how he has that kind of power and I would like to see him, use it in the future yeah i'm not yeah. saying I, I know that he is just still starting out he's only just releasing his first album but i think that even though asian american rappers are a minority within the kinds of rappers i think they can still be advocates no it'll it'll be really interesting to see how it all plays out i think that at the end of the day like if let's not lose how do i put this this is the purest in eugene that always sort of like likes to make sure people don't lose sight of it. It's the reality of having a point of view and speaking up and helping formulate a perspective. And I mean, there's enough candy, candy wrap bullshit out there that I think is dominating the airways. And I think that's part of the reason why maybe I just grew so disinterested in the space. I don't know if it's necessarily coincided with, and this is me in full transparency, if for anyone that doesn't know, I don't really give a shit about music to be honest. And people are like, oh, that's 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 impossible to believe, right? But you know, dating back to when I was in university, like I I really enjoyed music, and then at some point it just fell off. It just wasn't interesting anymore, and I don't know if that's just been something that's been a dominant trend over the last I don't know. I'm gonna date myself. Let's say ten years, right? So yeah, I don't know. Um, I feel extra I, fired up today. I feel strongly about music as a medium in which people can express, can tell their stories authentically, and then also can change culture through music. And I feel more strongly about music as a medium that can do that than fashion. Like, and that's like my, my personal preference, right? Like not, I'm not stating any statistics, just how I personally feel when I talk about the subject of music and artists. Mm -hmm. Like I yeah. get more excited about what they can do. Cool, I think honestly we touched on some good points there. I'm ready to move yeah. on.
All right, so my topic today is in GTA Online, are class wars developing? So I almost fixed this. I almost yeah, fixed this. In full transparency, like, oh, maybe that's a bad thing that we're both sort of on the same wavelength, but... Wait, 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 uh, but maybe not. Maybe it's because... I don't know. Continue. Anyways, uh, so players in GTA Online, which is sort of this... What's the right uh, terminology for it where it's a massive multiplayer online game? You just you know, got it. Like, that, that's what it is. Oh, is that is that what it is? Yeah. Okay, there's a there's a, a acronym <laughs> for it. MMORPG. That's that's it. So yeah, in this M M O R whatever 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 you said it you got said it. it. Okay. Yeah. In Anyways, that. And correct me if I'm wrong. It's kind of like World of Warcraft, but for GTA. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So you're able to run around, participate in various activities, whether it's combat based. Uh, economy based and you're basically able to do a bunch of illegal things that you would definitely not be able to do in real life like sell drugs um, exactly and, sell and guns. i think one of the interesting things is over the course of the last few years obviously the video game world has blown up it's crept up a lot and maybe this is sort of like take a step back and why do we talk uh, why do we talk about it so much but as you can see it kind of creeps up a lot into a lot into like the making sort of uh, yeah. briefing <laughs> Maybe it's just a combination of so many different things. this technology, art direction, storytelling, all these things. But maybe it's just this new modern medium that it's very difficult to shake. But that aside, what's interesting is that there's various power-ups, weapons that you can purchase within the game. This is sort of the current business model in, in a lot of games where people can play or they can play and they can also pump real money, real fiat currencies into the game and then start buying things, buying power-ups and whatnot. So having said that, there are certain weapons that you can buy that just basically obliterate your opponent. Mm -hmm. And there's like cannons you can buy. There's also like uh, cards you can buy that provide you in-game currency. Yeah. So while this this whole topic kind of surrounds this, this cannon that they have, what's fascinating is that like sort of the way the game mechanics are being influenced and... And sort of taking the fun out of it because the game in some ways is less about skill now. It's more about like who has the means to potentially power up, who has the means to necessarily participate in a like way who that, has you the, know. Who has the real world memes? Like who has the, the financial abilities in the yeah. actual real world, like real yeah, cash, they apply not, not game you. cash, that can then ruin gameplay. Like that's yeah. that's the interesting part. That's a more direct way. I felt I was dancing around the answer there, or dancing around the statement. No, no, just but because yeah. because there is there is in game money, right? And you can earn in game money by playing the game, but you can also buy things by using real money. Yeah. So that that's the element that we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So what is interesting is like. Games now, all of a sudden, and, you know, FIFA is another example where people can buy, you know, some of the, the rarest or some of the best players. They can mm -hmm. buy power-ups to ensure their players, you know, heal faster, they have more energy, etc. So those things are all really fascinating to me because it's no longer about a skill-based thing, but it's sort of, you know, other things in the real world are creeping into this part of this sort of corner of culture that was generally speaking it was it was sort of devoid of that it was sort of an escape mm -hmm. yeah so yeah my like question an to escape you, from society yeah exactly so my, my question to you Sharice is mm -hmm. how uh, do you spend money on games and if so how do you feel when you transact you know do, do you think twice about you know putting down your credit card I mostly play very slow games I don't play any online games I, I don't play any games with other online players so there's not really anything that i play that requires my money so i like buy the initial game but then i don't play the games that come with the kind of features that gta online does or like star wars battlefront which was the other video game that got a lot of flack recently yeah for, correct. for having a uh, pay to win mechanisms mm, i don't know it's, 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 see i obviously understand where GTA and Star Wars and all these video games like where they're coming from because obviously this can make them huge revenue. This is a total aside, yeah. but it's still somewhat relevant. Uh there's like there was a patent that got filed where EA Sports was algorithmically going to figure out the best way to like induce sort of habit forming <gasps> um design so that yeah. you would just spend more money. 
I mean, Ooh. it's not that far-fetched. It's just optimization, but it just sounds really You bad, know what right? it sounds like? It sounds like how people optimize casino design so that people would stay longer. Yeah, pretty much. I think it's not that different. Yeah. Um, but right. So I was, I was going to say, obviously, I understand where the game companies are coming from. Right. I'm not going to deny that they make huge, giant buckets of money. But I think that the thing that is most depressing to me is how it makes the game less fun. Like if somehow there was a way to you could spend money and therefore make the game more fun for everyone, I feel like I'd be more on board. But I realize what I'm saying sounds like socialist in a way, like finding a way like to make everyone driven, right? happy. Um, but I just... I just feel like the element of a game is that you you have to go through the actual game in order to win, right? And if you yeah. can just jump in immediately, it would be even rewarding if you had to reach a certain level before you could pay money. Yeah. I just don't, yeah. like, do, do, there's just no reward in terms of or, actual game experience if you can just jump in immediately and put down the cash. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's, that's very fair. And I, I think... I'm I'm looking at it, I'm thinking about it. Is there a way where some of the money injected into the economy is, you know, you take a rake, you take a skim off the top and that gets reintroduced somehow mm. and benefits everyone else. You know, I'm just making this up. This It's like, yeah. imagine if there you start off, you know, on January 1st, there are 10 levels and at each progressive financial milestone, oh, you know, $10 million. Okay, we unlock five new levels. You know, there's a lot of those things that could be introduced. I think that would just almost incentivize two, maybe. Actually, um, the thing about for me, like what made the GTA, the, the write up in the briefing interesting to me is the last paragraph. Uh, did you write this one? Uh, this was Nate. Okay, the last paragraph that he games. wrote. Because all the beginning stuff, I'm like, oh, I've heard this before, like about other video games. Nothing really new. But then the last part about how GTA as a game is a satirical take on American culture and this cash infusion actually makes it more like real life. Yes, this is actually a point I was going to bring up because I was trying to compare it to like, let's say professional sports, right? And in leagues where there's a salary cap, it's less of an issue. But like in European like soccer football, they have financial fair play, but it doesn't really mean all that much. So it's really whoever has the most money can spend as much money as they'd like. You have like a lot of, you know, corporations and oil money backing these teams. So it's actually not that far fetched to have some people that have more means. Um, it doesn't guarantee victory, but it sure as heck sort of puts them that much closer. Yeah, yeah. I actually think because of this element, because the fact that GTA is already meant to be like an in-game version of some parts of society, the fact that there is a pay-to-win thing is interesting from how it creates a larger picture of society. Yeah. Unlike yeah. Battlefront, which I feel like is totally ridiculous, like the way that they have those loot crates that you can pay for, and, yeah. and Star Wars being completely fantasy anyway, I don't think it adds anything... It doesn't add anything conceptual. I guess that's what I'm saying. Where is this? I can kind of see it as a concept. Maybe it's also different too, because I don't know why people play video games, right? People, have, well, I know why they play them, but let me, let me rephrase that. <laughs> I mean, you can't cut it. You cannot cut that out. <laughs> All right, fine. So people play video games for different reasons. Some people play for the challenge. People play to win. People play just for that escape. So maybe the reality is that even if people lose, they don't really care. Is that is that accurate? I think um, it's in some degrees accurate. I, I, I guess it, okay, so I haven't played GTA Online, but I think like some of it will come down to mechanisms in the game. Like there are some fine points that we didn't talk about. Like the cannon can only be fired every 48 minutes. You know, like there are some limitations um, and those could make a difference. Like they could, those limitations or like the framework in which it happens can change whether an ang whether a player is like angry about it or not, or whether they accept it as like, this is part of how the game goes. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that I know there's a real in-office example of someone who 
doesn't play to win, Elphick, okay. always gets hammered at FIFA. He still comes back. <laughs> you he's going to edit this and he's going to You're saying it. this just so he can hear it while we're recording. Basically. Got but it. that's the thing. is like, that's an example. Someone just plays for fun. Not necessarily. I mean, I don't know how many times he's said, I hate this game. I don't know why I play this game. See, the but thing, he still comes back. But that I think that's the difference I'm talking about is like when you perceive that there is fairness in the game and you lose, then it's still fun. But if you yeah. perceive that there is a a way to trick the game, like or essentially that it's that oh that was so cheap, right? Like the way someone won was cheap, then you feel like oh, I shouldn't have lost or I shouldn't have whatever happened to me shouldn't have happened. Yeah. So. That's a good place to cap things off for the day. If you are interested in learning more about Make It and our membership opportunities, which include exclusive content, a members only Slack channel, and so much more. You can head over to Megan.com. You can also subscribe to us through your favorite podcast app and platforms. And if you like this podcast, you can do us a huge favor by reviewing us on iTunes or sharing this podcast with a friend. Sharice and I are pretty happy that some people actually went through the trouble of reviewing this podcast on iTunes. Yeah, no, it makes Kinda me ha- really happy. Pleasantly surprised. Yeah, yeah, we're thankful. Until next week, I'm Eugene. I'm Sharice. And this is Making It Up. <laughs>